my channel. My name is Charles. This is Survival Preparedness for the Beginners. Hello, YouTube. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about some certain things that I have run across um, on the web, looking at some different websites, uh, government websites, actually, uh, but things that aren't being told to us by the news media, the government, local news, national news, or any news by that fact. They like keeping us in the dark until it's too late. And that's why I'm here. So before we get going though, if you would please hit that like button, hit the share button, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button and click that little bell so you can so you get notified when I do any of my videos. Now let me put my spectacles on so that we can get going on this. Now a lot of this stuff that I am going to be covering here, um, it all is from the, uh, the first portion of it is from the USDA. This was all published on December 2nd of 2019. Um, we're gonna start off right here. Changing climate is affecting agricultural in the United States. The changing climate presents a real threat to the U.S. agricultural production, forest resources, and rural economics. These threats have significantly implications not just for farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners, but for all Americans, you and me. Land management across the, and across the country are already feeling the pressure of the changing climate and its effect on weather. As these risks continue and amplify, producers will be faced with the challenges of adapting to the changing climate. Go figure. But nobody wants to talk about that. Not on any of the news stations I watch. Here are some of the risks. And they list them right here on the USDA. Uh, more severe storms. More intense storms are supposed to be out there. Uh, more than in history for extreme weather events. Rising average temperatures. Here's the problem with that. Higher temperatures mean increasing in invasive species and costs for weed and pest control. So that means they have to spend more money and put more crap out there in our food, you know, to try to keep the pests away that aren't supposed to be there. That probably isn't good for us to eat, but nobody is going to tell us what is really in it. Extreme, extreme in, extremes in precipitation. In the Northeast, heavier, more intense rains threaten to reduce yields. When they reduce our yields, whenever you hear that said, that means less food. In the South, in the Southwest, increased drought poses a challenge to nut, fruit, and vegetable producers. More forest fires. The fire season is 60 days longer than it was 30 years ago. And a recent forest study, Forest Service study, predicts that the number of acres susceptible to fires will double by the year 2050. western side of the United States is just going to be one charcoal mess and it'll be another 20 years after that happens that things will start growing again which in that case you know at that point it'll be really good but what are we going to do between now and then that's the question all right now we're still on the USDA all right Harvest continued to move along slowly with multiple issues causing problems, wet fields and, and or grain, propane shortages, etc. Through the recent dryness has helped. Most soybeans have been harvested throughout the region as of November 24th. Corn was further behind with the northern states the worst off. Very wet grain has increased drying costs and led to the spotty propane shortages. So see if the grain is wet. They can't just take it and sell it. They can't take it and just dump it somewhere. It has to go through a drying process first before they can take and take it to 
wherever they is they sell their product. Wetness has slowed additional fall field work with the wetter than average soils over all but the eastern corn belt. Soils have bounced around freezing in northern areas causing additional slowdowns. Whenever you hear the word slowdowns in the farming community, it isn't a good thing. Where fields were too wet to harvest before freezing. Current soils are near freezing from North Dakota into South Dakota. The large snows have led to added issues, slowing additional harvest. Slowing word again, not good. Harvest attempts are likely to continue at a slow rate. Large numbers of acres of corn and possibly even some soybeans will not get harvest until the spring. Now here, let me just give you a, a little tidbit on what that means. I grew up in Indiana. I lived there until I was uh, 17. Lived out in the middle of the country, uh, surrounded by cornfields. We had our house and cornfields, all right? And the way it has to work is, is the farmers, you know, they have to uh, take in, they, there's a certain way that they have to do all this kind of stuff, all right? So in the spring, they plant their seeds, they tend to their crops throughout the year, whatever they have to do to them, and then in the fall they harvest. So once the harvest is over, then they till and plow. And that means that the farmland is good to go for the next year. So they go out and as soon as they can, they can go out and plant the seed again. So what is gonna happen now is, is wherever they can't get this stuff out of there, for one, the first problem is, is the farmer is gonna take a huge loss on his corn yield. So it's gonna sit out there all winter long. He's gonna probably take it up to a 50% marginal loss from, from what I've seen in all these papers and what I read on the USDA. USDA. So they're gonna end up taking a 50% loss on what they would have got if they could have harvested it this year, which they couldn't do. So now they have to harvest it in the spring once the fields dry out enough to where they can harvest. At that point, there should be putting the seed into the ground, not harvesting their product from last year. See where we're going? Okay, so now the farmer has to harvest the product, has to turn right around. It's like a turn and burn. He has to turn right around, plow the field, and get seed into the ground because what's gonna happen is it's gonna be a ripple effect and the poor farmer is never going to catch up because he's always going to be behind on everybody else that is doing everything the way it's supposed to be done. Follow where I'm going with this? It's not, it's not a good scenario. So the farmer is going to take a loss in his products because he's going to have to try to sell as much as or get as much as he can out of whatever is left in his fields so that he can turn around and rebuy more corn seed to turn around to plant it back into the ground. But do you think the government's gonna help out the farmer? Nah, they'll probably just screw him over and charge him more or take his farm, one or the other. <clears throat> the farmer is the, one of the, the most abused entities in this country and it's one of the most important. We have to have food to eat. Between, 19, between 1913 and 2019, food experienced an average inflation rate of 3.12% per year. This rate change indicates significant inflation. In other words, food costing 20 bucks in 1913 would cost in today's prices $520.36. So if you bought a gallon of milk in 1913, it cost you 20 bucks, it cost you $520 now. Now we're gonna go with, uh, I do have, uh, I printed off, and this is as today's date, which is 12-8-2019, uh, um, from the, you know, stock index. And, uh, you know, you know, nobody really talks about too much. You know, they talk about the basic number. 
um, you know, the S&P 500 and, and uh, um, <clears throat> all these kind of, you know, the um, all these indexes and stuff like that, but they don't talk about things in general. You know, they give you, well, this is, if this is a stock market up a couple hundred bucks or down, come, well, what's causing it to go up and down? Well, you know, the big thing they talk about is oil. All right, well, oil is basically unchanged. It's at 61 bucks a barrel, okay? Um, natural gas is down. Um, heating oil is down. Propane's down. Uh, uranium is down. Uh, gold's down. Silver's down. Um, so that basically covers a lot of the big hitters, all right? Now let's get into the little stuff that nobody really talks about, all right? Ego cards are Oh, what? Oh, you mean the food and stuff that we eat? Yeah. All right, so soybeans, they're down six bucks. Wheat's down eight bucks, all right? Uh, cheese is unchanged. Palm oil's down $16. And if you actually look, and if you actually look up what palm oil goes into, uh, that's a big thing. Big thing. All right, <clears throat> orange juice is down, canola's down, coffee's down, uh, tea's unchanged, cocoa's down, oats are down, sugar is up by 0.12, so it's up just a hair. Uh, lumber's down, corn's down. Let's get into some livestock now. Live cattle, that's down. Feeder cattle, that's down. Beef, that's down. Poultry, that's down. Everything is going down. You know, and then you get over into your aluminums and zincs and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I mean, this is just, that's just the stuff that prints off the computer when you do the whole thing. The point is, is everything is going the wrong direction, you know. And for half of it is, as, um, as you're going to hear here in just a second, uh, you know, we didn't hit um, basically the goals that were set, you know, because every, every type of... Um, economy that is sold on the stock market or whatever, you know, they all have their certain goals that they're, you know, expectations they're supposed to hit. That's the word. And uh, they all fell short. So now people are like either, either freaking out or whatever else. So this one comes from, um, uh, this is from farmlead.com. This is basically for farmers. And this was published as of today. And the headline today is December 18th, soybean wheat prices readjust on global headlines. Grain markets are mostly in the red as complex pulls after four straight days of gains, which saw wheat prices jump nearly 4%. So four days ago, everything was up, especially wheat was up 4%. Now it's all down, all going down the tubes. Here's a little quick saying. <clears throat> this was from Confucius, and he was a Chinese philosopher. When it is obvious that the goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals. Adjust the action steps. Think about that. That's a good one. <clears throat> now, I mean... Uh, it starts off with the, uh, the Canadian peas and the Canadian lentils. Um, they actually are doing quite well. They, uh, uh, they must have had a really good year up there. Uh, their crops are all up, um, which is, I mean, a good thing for them. I mean, you know, we're all in this boat together. We all got to survive. So if we can't get food from one place, maybe we can get it from someplace else. <coughs> Soybean prices climb but do not have headwinds. Monday, the NOPA crush report showed that only 164 million bushels of soybeans were used by its members in November. This was well below the 172 million bushels that the market was expecting to see. So see, we fell short again. It was 10.5 million bushels below the record amount realized in October. So they knew in October that they were down, but they just kind of let it go. Don't know why, but they just let it go. Okay, 
Further, it was about 2 million bushels below the volume crushed in November of 2018. That said, the markets largely ignored the smaller number instead of focusing on the trade war deal, as mentioned in Monday's Farm Lead Breakfast Briefing, and trade off its implications instead. The capital economical uh, Caroline Bind says that despite the trade war, phrase one deal being uh, agreed to last week, soybean prices will drop in 2020 to the average of $8.50 a bushel. And right now it's at like $9.40 nine, nine, $9 a bushel. So they're gonna take almost another dollar hit. The chief economic commodities economic expert for the firm says the reason behind her bearish forecast is that the Chinese demand for the U.S. soybeans won't build back up overnight to pre-trade war levels. We all know that the American swine flu continues to spread and that already more than half of China's peak population was killed off in 2019, but it has been suggested that they may be turning the corner and rebuilding the herd. As genetics notes, <clears throat> so they're going to start using genetics to make their own pigs. Through China has a huge shortfall of breeding pigs, many that a quick rebuild is very unlikely and that it will take many, many years, three or more. So this African swine fever flu thing that's going around all over, it's not just here or wait, it's not here yet. Supposedly, that's what they're saying, but it's in every country that's around us. So it's only a matter of time before somehow or another it gets in here. I did some reading up on that African swine fever and it can be brought in on human clothes, um, on anything that had been brushed against any of these wild pigs or that type of pork that is infected with this. Um, <clears throat> so what would happen is um, in certain airports, they actually use dogs to try to sniff this out if people have been to certain parts of the world, um, Africa being one of them, China, uh, these areas to make sure that they don't bring this in here. But we all know it's just a matter of time before somebody screws up somewhere and oh well here you go there goes half of our bacon but in um so i don't have to sit here and, and read anymore um as i, I recapped again um uh, like this, on this one here from uh farm lead uh, they're also reporting that everything is down corn's down soybeans down soybean meals down soybean oil oats wheat um, canola. Everything is in the red. Everything is going south because everything has basically, in a sense, in our country, we did not meet our expectations. Now, what I am going to say next, um, I have talked about in a uh, couple of my different videos, and I talk about how I pack my things in smaller bags instead of doing the larger bags. Now there are two main ingredients that if you're going to stockpile, you need to stockpile a lot of in case of some type of a um, climate changing effect on our food uh, being produced. Uh, because you know what, if we can't produce the grains and we can't produce that kind of stuff, that means you're not gonna be producing much livestock either because you have to have something to feed these things. And if the farmers, the ranchers, if they have livestock, but they don't have any, you know, nice green grassy areas where these things can just graze and they're all dried up, well, they have to rely on hay, wheat, whatever else they're gonna to have to feed these animals. And if they don't have it, they're gonna die. We're left with nothing. And then it's gonna get real ugly. So my suggestion is there's two main commodities that you need to make sure that you have um, a lot of, salt and sugar. And if you go back in history and you look, salt and sugar, all the way back into 
the Egyptian times, um, besides honey, was the two main things that people had to have and that would kill over. So <clears throat> I would suggest getting five gallon buckets, at least, you know, it, just to start off with, you know, if you can go to Sam's, Costco, you know, any place like that, BJ's, um, those areas, you know, you can buy the, the big large bags of salt and the, and the 25 pound bags of salt, the 25 bags of, you know, pounds of sugar. So if you, you, you get a hold of, uh, uh, buy yourself some uh, five gallon Marlar bags, go out and get you um, uh, some plastic buckets. And um, you could, I mean, if you don't have to, if, if, you, if you can't afford to do the food grade buckets, as long as you're putting it in the Marlar bag, then just get a bucket with a good sealable lid. A Home Depot bucket, those bucket, whatever. You know, sometimes those are real dirt cheap. But put the bucket inside, dump it in there, and seal it up. You know, I mean, you got to try to get the air out of it and seal it up because you don't want to put uh, oxygen absorbers in your um, uh, salt. I don't put it in my salt, and you want to make sure that you know you just you try to get much air out. Seal the bag up, put the lid on it, and there you go. Because when it comes right down to it. Those are two of the biggest things that you're gonna be able to, to barter with if you have to in any given situation. So if you could, you know, if somebody had something that you needed and you have this whole bucket full of salt or whatever, and you can say, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two cups of salt for whatever. Then there you go, you got something to barter with. But on that note, I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention because uh, when, I, when I first stumbled across all this stuff on these are government sites. Um, it kind of blew my mind away when you can't find any of this information of what's really going on out there in the world and in our own country. Um, it's all basically politics, politics, and politics. And I'm not getting into politics. But I will say, you know, um, somebody out there really needs to wake up but then again, the government doesn't want us to know about anything bad that could be happening or coming our way. You know, it's kind of like being blindsided if you're playing baseball and you kind of glance away for a second and you're batting, you know, and you get hit in the head. You know, well, you shouldn't have took your eye off the ball. You know? So what I'm committed to do, like I said in the beginning, you know, I believe that when I run across stuff like this, I want to make sure that you people out there understand it, understand why I am doing what I am doing why I want to make sure that people are prepared, why, I, I mean, I care. That's the reason I'm doing this. Um, it's the whole reason I started my channel. I care about the, the American people out there. I believe that we all have to stick together. I also do believe that, you know, we have to prepare ourselves, prepare our families, and be ready for whatever comes along if something happens and, you know, the government screws up. Climate change really takes a huge, you know, another whole turn and, and everything goes topsy-turvy. You know, you have the magnetic fields are changing in this country. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, everything, I don't know, in my opinion, all this kind of stuff, you know, starts going hand in hand. You know, you got the solar minimum. We're in, minimum. We're in that right now. And they're, now they're saying they don't know how long that's going to last. And that is detrimental to the farmers because it is typically cooler than average and not warmer. So, you know, a lot of things don't like to grow when it's cooler, you know. Um, but anyways, um, my name is Charles. This is Survival Preparedness for Beginners. If you would please hit that like button, click that share button, hit subscribe, hit the little bell, and until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side.